We're going to be talking today about the witch of Endor, also called the medium of Endor, and whether she raised Samuel the prophet as the person from the dead, or whether that was a demon pretending to be Samuel. And this whole passage is something that people use wrongly to justify going to a medium. And Jen and I are going to talk to you about why that's not something that we should be doing at all and why. Jen, thanks so much for joining with me today. Thank you for having me, Doreen. This is so great that we're talking about this. And I just want to echo what you said, that um, this this passage has been used as an excuse and a justification to see mediums and from people claiming that God contradicts himself. So I'm really excited that we're going to set the record straight today. Well, you and I are going to be representing the two main views of uh, whether this was actually Samuel or whether it was a demon. Yourself, you're going to be exegeting from uh, a lot of the respected theologians who are going to uh, point that it's actually God's providence to raise Samuel for Mm -hmm. giving Saul this message that did come true. And I'm going to be talking about the exegesis of why um, I and others believe that this is actually a demon pretending to be Samuel. It's a difficult passage. And we're going to be using the theological method of hermeneutics called scripture, interpreting scripture. So we're going to be focusing on other passages to bring light to the first Samuel 28 passage about the witch of Endor. And we're commanded not to add to scripture, not to take away from scripture, not to change scripture. So God gave this exactly as he willed and intended. And, and as you said, Jen, the takeaway is always the same, no matter whether you believe this is Samuel, the prophet or a demon pretending to be Samuel, it is No, we're not to do necromancy, mediumship, psychic work, spirit animals, power animals, divination of any kind, astrology. Um, We're not to do that. Let's kind of back up for those not familiar with this passage. Of course, Saul was the first anointed king of Israel, and he was someone who was very um, self-absorbed. He was very ambitious, and he, he didn't need to be, but he was very willful and rebellious against God. And he had sinned against God by not listening to him about a battle that he was uh, directed specifically of what to do. And he kind of made up his own mind what to do. And at that point, God said, fine, and took his hands off of Saul and said, okay, you're on your own. And then the Philistines were coming to threaten Israel. And and Saul wanted to get information from God. What do I do about these Philistines? And he went to the normal channels, the God's prophets that did exist back then. They used Urim and Thurim, which we don't even know what they are. Don't even try to guess. They're not crystals. They're not rune stones. <laughs> They're something that God would have told us what they were, but he didn't because probably we would try and replicate, replicate them. But none of that worked. God was silent with Saul. So Saul on his own accord, after he himself had taken a, a, a kingly order to get rid of all the mediums and spiritualists in Israel, they were all banished because it is illegal under Mosaic law, under God's law. You and I both know from Deuteronomy 18 that witchcraft mediumship are condemned thoroughly. Anyone who does them is an abominable, detestable uh, abomination to the Lord. So, So Saul had rid the whole kingdom of mediums, and here he was wanting to go to a medium. So he went at night so he wouldn't be recognized he, he had a couple of his uh, men go with him who found this witch or medium, she's often called, uh, depending on how you exegete the Hebrew, of Endor, which is a town, a city. And he went there without telling this witch who he was to try to get Samuel to give him direction about the Philistines. So that's kind of the background of this. And It's kind of interesting when you look at the wording in Hebrew. Now, I took just a little bit of Hebrew in seminary. I am not a linguist by any means. There's a lot of people who who can read Hebrew, but you and I both know how to use concordances and Mm -hmm. and uh, and, uh, commentary. And so, you know, she's called a Baalette, and we Mm -hmm. both know Baal is the demon Mm -hmm. god of that time. uh, That there was you know, demonic sacrifices made to him. And so to be a ball let, it's almost like being a Satan nest in a way that she was called. But what I found really interesting is that it's also called necromancy. 
uh, or a woman who was a mistress of necromancy as used in 1 Samuel 28, 7, twice in the verse. And it's primarily a subterranean spirit and significant. So coming up from the earth, and this is in Strong's Concordance. In these three examples, it is usually interpreted as a ghost or familiar spirit, that's a mm -hmm. demon, mm -hmm. conceived and dwelling in necromancer, but this apparently was not the ancient conception. But it also talks about that it has to do with um, being a ventriloquist of the dead. So practicing their art of seeking the dead for instructions, probably ventriloquism. Now, you and I were both mediums, and so you and I both remember that when we would bring forth people's deceased loved ones, we thought they were their aunt Ruth or their mom or their dad or child. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would bring forth information. We were the ones getting it, right? It wasn't Correct. like our clients saw what we were seeing. Right. We, we were the ventriloquists, like this Hebrew right. word is saying. And so we'd say, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this woman. She's got her uh, gray and black hair, and she's wearing a red polka dot dress. And they'd say, that was my Aunt Ruth's favorite dress. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they would recognize her. And that's so similar to what we're reading about here is that Saul was the one who said, I want you to call up Samuel. Mm -hmm. And so then the next thing is the, the witch of Endor says, I see an old man with a robe. And then that's Saul going, oh, that's Samuel. Just like right. in that example of Aunt Ruth with the red polka dot dress. So mm -hmm. she's the one seeing them. And so I, I keep going back to, to another instance in the Bible, which could be said to be the dead coming up, which is the transfiguration with oh, Moses yes. and Elijah, right? Yeah. And with, okay. Moses and Elijah, it wasn't a medium. Everyone there saw them, right? right. But right. in this case, only the medium saw Samuel. The, so Saul, Saul did not see Samuel in this. So that to me shows that it's a demon. It's not like the transfiguration where God has got Moses and Elijah there. Does that make sense? That's a great, yeah, no, I love that. I well, love she's, that. She's an intermediary. Um, also, it moves to the next section of this passage, 1 Samuel 28. It moves to Samuel speaking to Saul and warning him and rebuking him. And so in, in that part, it's not clear whether it's, again, the medium being a, a, a ventriloquist or not. It's not mm -hmm. clear whether, I mean, it's clear that Saul, Saul's very upset with what he hears, but is he hearing it through the medium? It's not made really clear. God breathed every word of the scripture and he, con he controls everything in the scripture, including the translations. And there is no uh, corruption by Constantine or the Roman Catholic Church, as we used to <laughs> believe in the new age. That's not historically possible even, uh, but what we do know is that if God wanted us to know for sure whether this was Samuel or not, he would have put that in the Bible. So the fact that he left it as a mystery is God's will, and we need to respect that. It's interesting to look at this, and our whole point of this video, as Jen said, is to warn people away from mediumship and to show that God does not contradict himself. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dee. That's such a great that's such a great point that when you're not 100% clear of something that God is saying, or he hasn't um, completely given the, you know, the direct answer on it, it doesn't mean that you start going away from what he has been extremely clear about. And he is extremely clear not to practice divination. That's right. What is clear, and this is where I want to just, I had done some research on this passage um, before, and there's a... Um, a researcher, a theologian named uh, G.J.R. Kent, and I'll put his, a link to his research in the video description below. But he says that in, when the witch says, I see Elohim coming up from the mm -hmm. earth, she's using Elohim in the plural verb, not the singular. So that would be deities. That would be mm -hmm. more than one. And that'd be polytheism, which, as we know, is uh, condemned. Mm -hmm. And so even though Saul had banished mediums from Israel, he went to see this witch and here, you know, he's so desperate to save his own skin because he knows he's messed up that he's willing to go against his own rule against mediums <laughs> and pretend to be someone other than he is. I mean, he's just such a fool. Um, <laughs> what, what Kent said in his study that you know, I've got the link below is that if this was the real Samuel speaking with Saul, he would have rebuked 
King Saul for using divination and mediumship. He would have told him to repent like all biblical prophets do, right? Mm, Especially yeah. with, his, with his death foretold, Samuel would have said, repent while there's still time. So the fact that this Samuel impersonating spirit said that Saul would be with him the next day was also kind of an ominous signal that the demon was predicting Saul joining him in the second death. That's so an interesting I, point. Isn't that interesting? Because yeah. I mean, I, I think because you and I were mediums and we know the process of mediumship in our right. past before God so graciously saved us, we do not do anything with mediumship anymore except for warn people. But we were intermediaries. And, right. and, and those spirits would talk just like Aunt Ruth did or whatever deceased loved one. They would use the same lingo, vocabulary. They would make reference to things that uh, happened in the past. They would often predict the future accurately because demons can do that mm -hmm. to a point. And, and so uh, I, I hold the contention. And of course, I have so much respect for our church fathers who held the view that you had talked about, like mm -hmm. that it was Samuel. I mean, only God knows for sure. And in the end, it's not even really important whether it was Samuel or a demon, except that it's a warning to everyone to not go to a uh, medium. In fact, you could make the point if you said it was Samuel, that look what happened to Saul as a result. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he, he died. Was, he died. He died. He, he was in complete disobedience to the Lord and, and he died. The reason we can we can believe, if we want to, right? The spirit brought up by, uh, by the witch of Endor, which I want to be crystal clear about that as well, is that if you if you're in the camp that it was Samuel, it would not have been the witch doing it at all. It would have been God doing it. Okay, so I just want to be clear about that. And it's not an exception to his rules or anything like that. It's something that he would uh, decide usurping the. Um, evil powers of the witch. Uh, number one, he recalled his prophecy accurately and defended Yahweh's word. He had already given, he had already prophesied that he was going to die and he um, doubled down on this. He prophesied, um, prophesied Saul and his dynasty would join him in the place of the dead the next day and it happened. The witch panicked in a way that indicated this wasn't a usual occurrence in her satanic ministry. Um, we can defend that God not only allowed, but caused Samuel to be brought up because the witches panic, number one. Number two, equating rebellion with witchcraft. This was confirmation that Yahweh had pronounced judgment on Saul for being so far gone from the Lord that he'd seek out a practice that was punishable by death. Now, I want to speak to this just as a former psychic medium. Um, it was my, not only was it my livelihood being a psychic medium way before it was my livelihood I was do I was doing readings for years and I would sit and invoke demons although I did not know that they were demons and so when I would do a reading it would it would probably have shocked me as well to have seen something or somebody that I wasn't used to seeing um, this is something I had done for years so that's you know, that that's what puts me on the fence um, a little bit, just her reaction to this. I mean, this is what she did. She was used to doing this. This was her business. Why was she so surprised? Um, just saying. So digging in a little bit more, um, I, R.C. Sproul of Ligonier, um, he has since passed away. We really lost one of the best, um, a great godly man, a really great teacher, uh, R.C. says, uh, all we know clearly from scripture is that what Saul was doing was absolutely forbidden by God because it was an example of the act of necromancy, of trying to communicate with the dead. That's what necromancy is. And of course, we can see that it's condemned by God in Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. It is not clear whether the witch of Endor was a magician, like some people who do seances today and imitate the voices and figures of those who have passed on, whether it was a demon doing a false work that the devil does of lying signs and wonders. Of course, we know that from 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, that Satan does masquerade as an angel of light, um, or whether it was actually Samuel who was called up from the dead in opposition to the explicit 
prohibition of God. We don't know the answer. And I love Sproul's take on this. We don't know the answer concretely. Just like you said in the beginning of this video, Doreen, that God didn't um, tell us exactly whether it was him or not. And of course, we're, we're looking at the scriptures, we're diving in, but Sproul makes it clear that it's an example of what not to do. Do not consult or practice psychic mediumship, witchcraft, necromancy, interpreting omens, fortune telling, so on and so forth. John MacArthur in the in his study Bible, the NASB, he um, also had put in his commentary section, the notes section, that he believed it was Samuel. SermonAudio.com, uh, which is a great resource, uh, goes over what did the Witch of Endor really do? That the woman here is comfortable with the nature of the request, even if not the illegality of it. She has dealt with familiar spirits before, being a witch and not a woman of God. She dealt normally with demon spirits who would impersonate the individuals called for and bring needed cash. Being a witch and not a woman of God, she dealt normally with demon spirits who would impersonate the indiv individuals called for and bring needed cash into the woman's coffers. It's not clear how the demons profited from this show, except that they gained this soul and others connected with the business for Satan's kingdom. As she begins her incantations, prayers, or whatever, she is startled. So here we go again with her reaction, which um, is interesting on both sides of this argument. Now she has done this before many times. She is a professional. She knows how to contact the dead. Her reputation was established in the region. But suddenly she saw not some disembodied spirit hovering over her waiting for her direction, but someone actually coming up out of the earth a resurrected corpse united to the very spirit of a man, Samuel, which really gets me to D just um, specifically naming him going throughout the rest of the Bible. When we're, we're dealing, when we see God talking about demons, um, you know, I, I mean, we have Legion, we have some other, right. When the seven sons of Sceva go to try and cast out, they're just calling him a demon possessed. Um, the man was demon possessed. So I think it's really interesting, the formal name of Samuel the prophet. Okay, uh, just to wrap up this couple, these couple of sentences, a resurrected corpse united, we read that. Her blood-curdling scream was a desperate cry of help. She had never seen anything like this before. Her own demonic gifts were being superseded by a heavenly force. Notice how she suddenly knew this man would only have come back from the dead if it were royally related. Upon taking a second look at her visitor, she realizes she has been deceived. Her description of what she has seen convinces Saul that he has had success. Um, so that's where I'm going with this, D. That's some, th those are just a couple of points. I know we can do a really, even a deeper dive into this particular argument that it is Samuel. And of course, the mission though of this video is again to, you know, just make it clear wherever you stand and and many godly men that God has used in amazing ways, the theologians of yesterday and today disagree on this topic. Yes, so they do. It's a difficult passage. So yeah. don't, yeah, that's right. And I would want people to know too, Dee, that um, neither view would make you a heretic. This is not heretical. This is not denying the Trinity or denying Jesus Christ. This is um, just a matter of, you know, where you see the, you know, as you said before, exegeting the text. And again, our church fathers, and they held different opinions and disagreed and great, um, great theologians. End of day, the, the most important thing is don't go to mediums, do not mm -hmm. practice it, do not consult it. And you can trust the word of God, even if you're not 100% sure, or he hasn't said, um, like Doreen said, that it was definitely Samuel or definitely not Samuel. Um, you trust the word of God. God is clear from the beginning of his word to the end. And the Bible is sufficient. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that all scripture is breathed into, uh, breathed into by God and profitable for correction, for uh, reproof, um, for equipping us to do all that we um, have to do and all that we need to do. Amen. Yeah. I mean, what I keep coming back to is, of course, God could do anything. He's God. Right. But there is really one thing God cannot do, and that is he can't sin. 
he can't contradict himself. So if he really did bring up Samuel through a medium, I mean, that's, I just don't believe God would sin. I don't believe God would contradict himself that way. So there could be something I'm missing in that. And I certainly am not in any way saying that if it's Samuel, God sinned, because that's impossible. That absolutely right. could not happen. I just really, in looking at the text, I think this mm -hmm. is an impersonator, as we know, 2 Corinthians 11, 14 mm -hmm. and 15, uh, that, the, that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, and he masquerades as our deceased grandfather as as an angel he he masquerades as in this case i believe samuel he masquerades as the holy spirit a lot of people think they're getting a message from the lord and right. and it's it's their oh. imagination or satan or a demon right see that's the thing d uh, and again i just want to be clear i'm not uh, we're just giving um doreen believes it was a demon i'm I really go either way on this right now. I find it a very intriguing conversation. I think it's great that we're talking about it. So just to entertain it, though, I think that if it, let's say if it was Samuel, just putting it out there, um, that it wouldn't have been the witch doing it at all, that the witch wouldn't have really been in control of that or bringing him up. I think it would have been um, God and his divinity and his power and his will making a choice to do that. So I think that's where like even calling it an exception, it would never be an exception. God, because I agree with you 100%, God is not going to sin. God is not going to contradict himself. So I, I couldn't even imagine either him allowing the necromancer or the psychic medium to be um, bringing up, resurrecting the prophet. So um, I'm, I'm with you on that, D. But it's it kind of interesting. And also, um, I'm glad you brought up the transfiguration, because somebody might also say, um, well, you see, God can um, bring a person back, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as you as you mentioned, Moses and um, Elijah were seen, but then you bring up the point that they all saw them, rather than just um, in, in the case of the witch of Endor, only she was seeing him. That is a very interesting point because I agree with you as a former psychic medium. That's right. Our clients were not the ones who were seeing the um, spirits, hearing the spirits um, or getting the messages. So see, I really could go either way, but I think that focusing on the most important part, just don't do it. Right. There's no justification here to do it. God is not um, telling you that he does it. So you should do it. Absolutely not. God is so clear. And there are so many verses about um, psychic mediumship, fortune telling and how God feels about it and not to do it. That's it's right. demonic. It's demonic. End of day. Yeah, it is. And it'll lead you astray. Um, the mm -hmm. demons mix in truth with lies to point you away from the real Jesus, to point you away from Bible study and church, a good solid church. And it, and it will destroy your life and send you it's I'm going to be blunt. It'll send you to hell. Absolutely. If you're not saved in Christ. And that's where Jen and I were headed before God so graciously saved us. And it's one more of many reasons why we each personally have to read and study our Bibles, even though it seems like a drag or boring. I don't have enough time. I can't focus. I can't concentrate. I, I know all the excuses. So does Jen. But <laughs> otherwise, people, you, you'll see posts on the social media that will say, hey, the Bible talks about astrology. So it's it's fine. You know, you can do astrology. The Bible talks about um, mediumship. So you can do mediumship. Look, it's in the Bible, unless you know the context by reading it yourself. Amen. That just happened today, actually, in my TikTok live, a lady who calls herself a Christian tarot card reader. Oh. She said that, see, see, I'm reading her the passages about divination. And she goes, see, it's right there. See, he's talking about it in the, in the Bible. I know the Bible. Yes, he's talking about it. He's telling you not to do it. He's saying not to do it. And you know, Dee, like I said, I think in the beginning of this video, unlike this, this particular passage where we're kind of, you know, we're going back and forth, we're having this conversation. God is so clear. You shall not learn to imitate the detestable practices of the nations there. Do not consult. It's so crystal clear. It's not a matter of even that you have to go in there and try to, you know, go into commentaries and go into all this. It's so clear. He's yeah. so clear about it so clear and some people will say to me i'm sure you hear this too that, well that's old testament but it's in the new testament too check out acts 16 16 about that's a girl exactly who was, where i go yeah this girl who was possessed by a a, a serpent spirit mm -hmm. 
And it caused her to be a really accurate psychic medium who made a lot of money for her handlers until Paul um, prayed it out and such. And, and then Acts 19, where the former sorcerers are convicted and they burn thousands, some, sometimes the commentators will say millions of dollars worth of basically sorcery, witchcraft, new age type of books. And, and some of them will say it's little vials that they had with little potions and powders and stuff. And, and so it's not just Old Testament is what we're saying. You can look at the book of Revelation. It says that those who are sorcerers will go to the lake of fire, hell, for eternity. Uh, it's, it's not us trying to ruin your fun. We understand that new age methods seem to work. We understand they seem to be comforting. We understand they seem to be loving, but it's all just a counterfeit. It's just a masquerade. Uh, in reality, it's hateful to point people to hell away from Jesus. And I hope you can understand, if not today, someday, that Jen and I love you and care about your soul. And that's why we make these videos. When we get so much hate feedback from doing these kind of videos, you wouldn't believe the kind of mail we get and the, the shunning that happens. People won't talk to us. And we're only doing this to warn those who have ears to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And something else that I think would be a great takeaway if you're going into the topic of um, this passage of the Witch of Endor, look at why what you mentioned before, D. Saul went because he was afraid of what was going to happen. He wanted to know things and he felt that God was silent. Um, and those are reasons today why people are going to psychic mediums and going to witchcraft and going to manifesting. They want something. They want to know something. They're afraid. They want to be comforted. They're hopeless. You know, all, all these kinds of reasons. And it is with great empathy that I say, I get that. I understand that. But you have a choice to go to God. There are two sources of supernatural power, God or the devil. You see what Saul did? He went to a woman who operated under demand. Even he knew on some level, it looks like, right? Because he could have kept going to God, but instead he sneakily went in the middle of the night. He knew something was wrong there. Oh, yeah. He himself had cast out all the mediums. Yeah. And I mean, the name Baalette, which is yeah. medium. I mean, that's the demon Baal. And yeah. so he knew he was going to something that was satanic and and like you said, uh, God seemed to be silent and for a reason, because he had sinned and rebelled against God so much. He wasn't listening to God. So God took his hands off, as we see in Romans 1, when God gives people over to their sins and say, here you go, party on, have fun. Um, and, you know, we all pray that people will hit bottom with that kind of behavior and then turn back to God from the pain that they're suffering from living the sinful mm -hmm. lifestyle. Right. And then he and then he died. He died the next day. So that's the whole point. Don't go. Don't go to anybody who is practicing the demonic. Don't go to because you're say whatever your reasons are. I just urge you and encourage you not to do that. Keep going to God and live in obedience to him. Read his word. Like D said, pray every single day. You will be in total awe. Just like I, I mean, I'm in awe of who God is. And the fact that I'm not in that hamster wheel, because every time you go to the wrong supernatural source for your information, um, peace, hope, or what have you, you will never be fulfilled because they cannot fulfill you. The, those demons do not care about you. They're liars and they cannot give you peace that only Christ can give you. So when you feel that way and you want to go do that, please just go to God, repent mm -hmm. for any readings you've already had get rid of burn your tarot cards, get rid of them, get rid of all the new age stuff. It's great to have these conversations. But again, the main takeaways are so important not to do this. It's demonic. God is clear and he loves you. Um, he's not a buzzkill. We're certainly not trying to be the buzzkill, but God is definitely not an angry grandpa who's trying to ruin your life. He's trying to save your life. He sent his only son to save your life. And I think that is so amazing. The love that Jesus Christ has for us, that he willingly laid his life down for us. He didn't even have to, and he did it anyway. So you can go to him and you know what? There's a lot of freedom 
in that. There's a lot of freedom that you won't be in that hamster wheel anymore, that you can come to Christ freely as you are. You can call out to him today and he will, he will come. You just have to put your faith and trust in him. And it's, it's just such an amazing um, change that only God can do. He changes the hearts of men. He changes lives. Now I'm going on my whole I, I always end up here. I just, yeah. you no, know, it's good. Keep going. It's it's I, beautiful. I always end up. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, let's share the gospel. Let's share the gospel. Cool. But we were born into sin and we're sinners, right? And God is holy. We cannot be in the presence of our holy God in our sin. So God says in John 3, 16, he so loved the world that he sent his only son, his only begotten son to um, die for the sins of the world and that whomever will believe on him will not perish, but have eternal life. So even though God doesn't need us, he wants us. We're his creation. And he made a way for us through Jesus Christ. And Jesus stepped out of heaven and into humanity. And he died a criminal's death, a criminal's death, though he's the king. And he did it. He committed no sin himself. And he did that. He took, he's the propitiation of God's um of our sin he appeased the god's wrath he drank the cup of wrath for our sin so that when we place our faith and trust in him and we accept the free gift it's a free gift it doesn't cost you a dime it's a free gift when we accept that free gift of salvation the bible says that we'll be saved when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that he is lord that he died on the cross for our sin that he was buried and raised the third day by our father in heaven and it's so amazing that he wipes the record clean then god will see you as redeemed as righteous and as innocent and he saves us he releases us from what we deserve first of all which is hell we deserve that punishment he didn't deserve to take any of that on the cross for us we deserve the penalty for our sin and jesus christ did it for you and for me he did it personally for you for your sins yesterday today and tomorrow and for mine and Doreen's, and it's just a matter of coming to him. And then it's an amazing how he, he imputes his righteousness onto us. It's just wonderful. And then we are released from the bondage to sin because without Jesus Christ, all of this is going to be confusing to you because you're spiritually blind. You can't see straight. You can't see the truth. What is bad seems good to you. And what is, what is yeah, and what is good seems bad to you. But Jesus, when when you come to him, he delivers you from your addiction to sin. We are literally addicted to sin. It is our master. And then when Christ sets you free, you have a new master, our Lord, and he is Lord and he is good. And he he works all things together for our good. Romans 8, 28. And that's just amazing. And that's why when you put your faith and trust in him, you will have peace. You can have joy. You will have joy. I'm telling you, Will, and Doreen, we have been through quite a few things, I'm sure, since we've been saved, and I can rejoice. You you share the gospel with such passion, sister, and I can feel it, and I just really appreciate you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you, too.